Andrew Simmons takes a look back at his life. He was by her side throughout the longest reign of a monarch in British history. For Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, it wasn't only a marriage, but a life of service to his wife, Queen Elizabeth II. Born into Greek and Danish royalty, Philip had a lonely childhood. He was taken under the wing of the British aristocracy. When he married the then Princess Elizabeth in 1947, he was a promising young naval officer. It was a fairy tale wedding for a country emerging from war and hardship. It all changed for the young couple when Elizabeth's father, King George VI, died at only 56 years of age. She became queen, and Philip, in the words of his private secretary, looked as if the world had fallen down on him. His naval career ended along with his independence. Prince Philip was sort of forced into making huge sacrifices. He was very much a, a man's man, not someone who was going to naturally fall into the position of playing second fiddle and walking two paces behind his wife and calling her ma'am in public and, and so on. And so began life in the Queen's shadow. Hundreds of engagements a year. He did, however, manage to find time for his own charities, helping young people and conserving wildlife very energetic, um, a problem solver, a sort of scientific cast of mind. So those were sort of, you know, on the positive side, the, the, the attributes that people admired. Sometimes though, you know, the, the, his, his detractors would, would, would say that, you know, some of his forthrightness could come across as rudeness. Philip did have a reputation for embarrassing and politically German incorrect Chancellor remarks. Has called Whether he was being rude about the Chinese or Indians forces or Russia's swearing at photographers, Ukraine. often a sideshow to former Russia now occasions. Has more troops there Yet even than though an air of racism hung over him, out in a staunchly Ukraine royalist in UK media generally the forgave him. Fueled fears of new it's fighting. A much easier ride Russia insists that it tend to make is the victim a of Western provocation. Uh, but I never known uh, Prince Philip to apologise for a remark, and uh, I remember once uh, he wandered over after he'd uh, said to an Aboriginal leader, "Do you still throw spears at each other?" And I saw him do this in Australia in 2002. And uh, the next day he came over; it made front pages all over the world. And he just wandered over and said, "The trouble with you is you've got no sense of humour, the complete absence of humour." So he wasn't going to apologise. His retirement from public duties came in 2017 with a send-off from the Royal Marines. Whatever the faults, his 60 years of public service was admired by many people. While their marriage was said to have had its ups and downs in the couple's younger years, Prince Philip remained dedicated and supportive to the Queen. She'll receive immense sympathy from a British public known to view her with respect and affection. Shalom. My name is Hadass, and I'm a teacher of Level 1 at the Rosen School of Hebrew. We believe that Hebrew is more than just a language. It is a reflection of a rich culture, an extensive history, and charismatic people. He was born Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark in 1921 on the Greek island of Corfu. His mother was Princess Alice of Battenberg, which made Philip a great-great-grandchild of Queen Victoria, just like his future wife. But Philip and his family were forced to flee Greece after a coup, and he ended up at Gordonston School in Scotland, where the disciplines of sport and achievement were to shape his future. Because from Gordonston, he went to the Royal Navy in 1939 as a cadet. His Majesty walking down the ranks of the cadets. And after he was at Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth before the war. At the back here, in the centre of the screen, is the 18-year-old Philip. He'd been asked to entertain the King's daughters during a royal visit. The eldest daughter, Elizabeth, is sitting along from her parents, just 13 at the time. Afterwards, they play croquet in the gardens outside. It was clear Elizabeth had taken a shine to Philip in Dartmouth that afternoon. But whatever might have started then would have to wait. World War II was about to take Philip far away. With the Navy, he fought the Italians and then the Japanese. But the young princess exchanged letters with Philip throughout the war years. 
which allowed them, when peace finally came, to pick up their romance. It's easy to see the radiant happiness of the princess. And in 1947, they got engaged. As she and her very good-looking husband-to-be pose for the cameras in the palace. And the wedding, when it came later that year, was to light up a post-war Britain still mired in bomb damage. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has called on Russian President Vladimir Putin to pull back his forces from Russia's border with Ukraine. The White House says Russia now has more troops there than at any time since conflict broke out in eastern Ukraine in 2014. The build-up has fueled fears of new fighting, but Russia insists that it is the victim of Western provocations. Russian state television offers a different way of looking at things. It reports that Ukraine and NATO pose a threat to Russia, and not the other way around. The narrative presents Ukrainian soldiers as the aggressors, and shows video footage of Moscow's response. Russian troops engaged in military exercises in Crimea. What to the West looks like saber-rattling is viewed differently by Russia. For Moscow, it's a necessary reinforcement of its defenses against the West. The majority of the Ukrainian military understand the fatal consequences of any actions that would lead to conflict. I hope they won't be provoked by politicians who in turn are being provoked by the West, especially the United States. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky sees Western troops, especially those provided by NATO, as essential backup for his own forces. There's an escalation in the Donbass region. Everyone can see it. When our soldiers are attacked and there are casualties, obviously we must retaliate. A few days ago, Zelensky paid a visit to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Zelensky stressed that the Western military alliance is Ukraine's only way to end the war in Donbass. Experts in Moscow say that statement would not have gone down well in the Kremlin. Any cooperation between Ukraine and NATO, any help from the North Atlantic Alliance, is a red flag for the Kremlin. But that doesn't mean that all members of the alliance welcome Ukraine's desire to join NATO as soon as possible. Right now, further steps towards membership are not on the agenda. A clear statement that gives many in Russia hope that a war is preventable. The people of Donbass are less optimistic, though the pro-Russian separatists insist they don't want war either. No. If Ukraine takes the first step, nobody knows where it will end. The Kremlin is doing all this to blackmail Ukraine and the West. If troops are reinforced, if the escalation continues, even a small provocation will be enough to set things off, with unpredictable consequences. Russia's defense ministry says this footage shows recent exercises. If the situation escalates, TV screens may soon be showing the real thing. Let's bring in our correspondent Yuri Reschetto in Moscow. Yuri, it was suggested in that report there that Russia's saber-rattling is part of an effort to blackmail Ukraine and the West. Can you explain the rationale behind that? Well, the experts I spoke to see several reasons for that. First of all, they all say that Russia doesn't want to annex Donbas, as it once did with Crimea. Instead, Moscow sees Donbas as a part of Ukraine, but on uh, its own Russian terms. And that means under largely Russian control. Through the politics in Donbas, Moscow even could before put the sun pressure rose. on all Ukrainian politics. Even That's what Moscow obviously wants. Uh, the Ukrainian President Zelensky understands that, and that is why he has changed his tactics towards Russia. In the beginning, he used to be looking for a dialogue with Moscow. Now he is choosing a completely different. Even before the sun rose, the sound of battle raged. Myanmar's armed forces moving into the city of Bago, an important gateway to the south. Behind the barricades, the protesters tried to stand their ground 
but the military advance was fierce. Automatic gunfire and evidence of heavier weapons. Pictures posted to social media appear to show rifle-launched grenades. And reports that three of Myanmar's ethnic rebel groups attacked a police station in the far eastern Shan state on Saturday morning. Unity amongst these disparate groups could be problematic for the military as it faces attacks on its outposts and civil unrest in towns and cities. At a news conference in Yangon, the junta's spokesman said support for the protest was waning and the death toll is considerably lower than reported with an ominous warning. If we really shoot at the protest group using automatic rifles, the 500 you refer to can be killed within hours. But the evidence from Mandalay on Saturday suggests protesters are still out in large numbers, marching through the streets despite the threat of detention or worse. Some have fled the cities, however, for the relative safety of the bases of the ethnic rebel groups along the border. While the conditions may be basic, the alternative could have been worse. We know that if we were to get arrested, the security forces would not let us live. They'd kill us, so we had to run away. And the steady flow of people heading towards the borders is growing, as many now fear Myanmar is on an unavoidable course towards civil war. A day after the killings and the funerals begin. The coffin of 13-year-old Tsai Wai Yen, draped in the flag of the National League for Democracy, or NLD, on Sunday. Although there were no protests where he lived in Yangon, the security forces still opened fire on people. As Buddhist monks led the funeral rites, friends and family expressed their grief. Why are you leaving me behind, cries his mother, inconsolable. As some of you may know, in a previous lifetime, I worked in the private equity industry doing merger and acquisition due diligence on different companies. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, a merger is a joining of two companies. Before Brett bent the knee, I took it upon myself to do an analysis on the potential merger between Brett and Patricia. Tonight, I share my results with you. Now, some of you might be wondering, what makes you an expert on Brett Chung? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Brett and I have been best friends since before I can remember. However, the earliest documentation points to 1990. <laughs> Together with two of the other groomsmen, Kevin Fang and Terry Lee, our childhood was blessed with a friendship built on the pillars of innocence and imagination. <laughs> Together, we would play real life adventures where we would save the galaxy from evil villains. We would play roller coaster by riding down my basement in a cardboard box. And we would build impregnable fortresses out of pillows and mattresses. It was the best of times and the future looked bright for us. Fast forward to our teenage years, 
and that childhood imagination was nowhere to be found. On the chart on the left-hand side here, you will see our creativity over time. Things were looking bright, but it all came crashing down in 1996 when the N64 was released. Outside of all the extracurricular activities that our parents made us do together, our free time was dominated by multiplayer action on the N64. <laughs> to this day, I still believe that our inner circle was kept to four people because the N64 only had four controllers. <laughs> and no one wanted to wait their turn to play Mario Kart. Fast forward another decade, and we're at the stage where we are today, adulthood. Despite the fact that Brett and I went to schools in different cities, worked and lived in different cities, we still found a way to stay incredibly close. Um, whether it was vacations back at home in Maryland, trips to different cities around the world, volunteering at camp, going to music concerts together, or having our bro reunions, <laughs> we always found time to stay close. One thing that I'm eternally grateful for, though, is that no matter where si which city we ended up in, we always found a way to find an amazing group of friends that we ultimately were able to bring together. And that is evidenced by the fact that Brett and I have 624 mutual friends together on Facebook. It's actually at least 625 today. But now I get into the fun stuff which is the deep dive on Brett Chung. <laughs> on this slide here, I have a chart of Brett's valuation over time, or what I like to call the husband index. <laughs> now, Brett comes from a good family and he grew up in a nice town, Potomac, so he IPO'd pretty strongly in 1985. <laughs> that continued to grow, and we had a spike here in 1989 when he meets Kevin Fang, the most guai and well-behaved person <laughs> I've ever met. Unfortunately, that was corrected the following year when he met me, me and Terry. <laughs> Sorry, Terry. The 90s were good for Brett. He continued to excel in school, rack up extracurricular activities, he had some nice internships, and then he matriculated into Columbia University, so we have this nice jump up here. <laughs> Shortly after, though, he met the Lamb Twins. <laughs> Despite meeting the Lamb Twins, Brett would still graduate from Columbia. <laughs> and we, we saw his uh, husband and ex grow as he got his first job, he grew professionally. Uh, we saw a little hiccup in 2011 when he would meet his future MVP at his bachelor party, Brian Che, all day, AKA the savant. <laughs> Fortunately for Brett though, he would get into Wharton the next year and we would see his man value rise from there. Now I know what you guys are thinking. Why is Brett's valuation so high and how do I short this? Now, before you do that, I would like to remind you that Brett is the modern day Renaissance man. Besides